Okay, and let's get started. So uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Clark. I'm a knowledge broker at the National Collaborating Centre for Methods and Tools. We are hosted at McMaster University, which is in Hamilton, Ontario, on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. I'm very pleased today to be joined by um, the knowledge translation student award recipients for 2022. Um, we are very pleased to be uh, sharing their projects today um, and it's really a wonderful opportunity to highlight the excellent work that's being done across Canada. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Um, if possible, we recommend using a wired internet connection um, for best results. Use the latest version of your browser. Um, but uh, the biggest thing is if you do have any questions uh, for um, uh, technical questions, you can send a message to Alana Miller at the NCCMT, um, and she will be able to help you out with any technical questions that you have if you're having trouble hearing or connecting in any way. Um, there will be a few polling questions throughout the webinar. Um, it, when they open, uh, they'll pop up over the slide that you're seeing. Please note that you hit submit at the end. Uh, these responses are all anonymous. There may be a slight delay in those coming up, but we will work through that when we get there. Um, after today, the webinar will be available um, on the NCCMT's YouTube account. Um, and we will post the slides in English and French on our SlideShare account. Um, so you can feel free to share those with anybody who was unable to attend uh, today's webinar. We'll make sure that we tweet um, at NCCMT when those are posted. Um, and you can also subscribe to our newsletter and those will be, be uh, links will be posted there as well. Um, and we will get started with our first uh, polling questions for today. So we are interested in figuring out uh, just how many people are joining us today. Um, this question was maybe a little bit more relevant prior to the pandemic um, when we knew that teams and offices would sometimes join webinars. Um, but um, uh, as of right now, you can select whether or not there is um, anybody joining you for uh, attendance at this webinar. Um, we're also happy to know um, if you are familiar um, and have used the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools website or our resources before, um, and really just how, how often um, are you um, fairly new to the NCCMT or are you maybe a, a veteran user and much more experienced with some of these products. So make sure that you uh, select your question or select your answers um, and hit submit um, and we will uh, record those answers those are very helpful for us and we, we certainly appreciate you taking the time um, and uh, jumping into it um, so uh, the national collaborating center for methods and tools is one of six nccs or national collaborating centers across canada um, we all are funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada, and our collective goal is to support public health professionals and organizations across the country. Uh, specifically, our focus at the NCCMT um, is supporting public health um, with evidence-informed decision-making. The other NCCs have uh, other topic areas of focus, uh, for example, um, the NCC uh, in, for Indigenous Health is in Prince George, uh, British Columbia. The NCC for Environmental Health is in Vancouver. The NCC for Infectious Disease in Winnipeg. Uh, there's one uh, NCC for Healthy Public Policy in Montreal. And finally, the NCC for Determinants of Health in Antigonish, Nova Scotia. Uh, so if you are not familiar with some of the other NCC's work, we do encourage you to check out their websites. Uh, there are some really fantastic resources to support public health at each of those websites. Um, so um, for quite a few years now, um, the NCCPH, so the Collective uh, National Collaborating Centers, have hosted the Knowledge, Tra Knowledge Translation Graduate Student Awards. Uh, Knowledge translation is a dynamic and iterative process that includes synthesis, dissemination, and exchange um, of uh, knowledge to improve the health of people in 
Canada provide more effective health services and products and work together to strengthen the healthcare system. Um, the purpose of these Knowledge Translation Student Awards is to recognize the work of graduate students for knowledge translation in public health in Canada. Uh, we did receive uh, quite a few applications this year. Uh, submitted projects were evaluated on their relevance to knowledge translation um, to public health uh, for creativity and innovation, for scholarliness, and for their potential impact. Um, and I am very pleased um, to then share with you um, this year's uh, award recipients. Um, so we have, uh, oops, I'm just going to pull up my notes here. I'm hoping this so very excited to share with you um, our three award recipients this year. Uh, we have uh, Shannon Bird uh, from the University, or from Brock University, um, who will be sharing art as a tool for promoting public and environmental health, um, a lesson plan for eco-justice educators. Uh, we also have Melissa McKay from the University of Guelph, who will present on maintaining trust through effective crisis communication during emerging infectious disease. And finally, Alexa Ferdinands, who will be presenting on collaborating with youth to address weight stigma in healthcare, education, and the home. Um, and with it, uh, without um, any further delay, I'd be happy to turn it over. Um, I believe we had Melissa up first. So I will stop sharing my screen at this time um, and invite you, Melissa, um, to unmute and share your screen um, as we're very excited to hear more about uh, your project. Great, we can so see much. your slides. Great, thank you. All right, I'm so happy to be here um, and I'm very honored to have been one of the award winners and I'm actually really looking forward to hearing um, about the other two projects as well. So during a time of crisis and uncertainty, the greatest asset we have in public health is trust. Trust impacts the speed at which we can move through a crisis and communication is a fundamental influence of trust. Trust in government, politicians, public health and healthcare have all declined over the pandemic in part due to inconsistent and ineffective crisis communication. So uh, as Emily said, my name is Melissa McKay and I'm a PhD candidate um, at the University of Guelph and with my advisor, Dr. Papadopoulos, we're working on understanding how to demonstrate trustworthiness and maintain trust through effective crisis communication with a special focus on applying this knowledge to social media. Uh, and just a note, um, I'm on day two of COVID, so I, I apologize in advance if I'm like clearing my throat or coughing, I'll try to mute if that happens. Um, but I know it's kind of not the nicest thing to listen to, so sorry if it does happen. So in terms of some background on the project, we received a SHRC Partnership Engage grant during the September 2020 competition. And ultimately it was to develop this guidebook so that would help public health understand how to apply evidence and best practices for effective social media crisis communication, specifically during emerging infectious diseases. So the project consisted of conducting a scoping review where we <clears throat> mapped the literature and conducted a thematic analysis of the evidence around effective crisis communication on social media. We also conducted an analysis of 32 influencer accounts on Instagram, and they did include um, public health, uh, government politicians, as well as um, what you might consider more influencer type accounts like science communicators and even brand influencers and celebrities. And we assess their crisis communication and the public's response to it. And then, so the guidebook itself contains evidence from the scoping review, as well as the Instagram project and some other research we conducted on the platforms, uh, Facebook and Twitter. So during this webinar, I'm gonna go over um, some aspects of the guidebook. It's quite brief, um, but hopefully it gives you kind of a taste and then I'm gonna provide the link to the full guidebook at the end. So communicating in a crisis is different than other types of health communication. High levels of uncertainty result from new and unfamiliar risks like COVID-19. During a crisis, people take in information differently, they're processing it differently, and they're acting upon it differently. And some of the differences are related to fear and how that impacts our ability to process information. But some of it is related to communication. And within the information landscape, 
especially you know, within our highly connected society today, we're being exposed to massive amounts of information, which you, you do know, um, but some of it's factual and some of it's false or deliberately mis misleading. And our ability to cut through this complexity relies on the trust that we have with individuals and our ability to effectively communicate. So there's an assumption that skepticism towards science or public health is a result of a lack of information. And that if we just can kind of provide more information about the things uh, that people are skeptical about, that you know, they're gonna follow our advice or engage in the behaviors that we're recommending. But as I previously talked about, there's actually a huge abundance of information on COVID-19 available you know, at all times from multiple you know, speakers. So the issue actually is that people are questioning the trustworthiness of science, of public health, of government, not because we're not providing enough information, <clears throat> but because we're not applying effective uh, crisis communication principles within our messages. And I'll talk about that a little bit further in the next few slides. We need to demonstrate our competence and our willingness to act in the best interests of the public through detailed, honest, and transparent communication. So effective communication during a crisis can save lives. Trust is one of the most important outcomes of effective crisis communication because it's influencing risk perception and it's impacting whether people are gonna engage in the recommended behaviors. We're competing against media, celebrities, brand influencers, conspiracy theorists, and so many others, especially online for attention. So in public health, we need a creative, coordinated, transparent, and targeted approach to communication to better meet the needs of the various communities and overcome that massive amount of mis and disinformation that's going around. And partnerships between public health and other trusted organizations or even individuals, uh, we found can boost the credibility and the reach of our messages, as well as reduce the impact of misinformation. So physicians, celebrities, brand influencers, media, and politicians that we know are viewed favorably by certain communities can be partnered with to have a more positive impact on risk perception, um, the ability of messages to go viral on social media, and if individuals are actually engaging in risk protective measures during COVID. So the guidebook Excel itself outlines this four-step approach, which allows you to draft crisis messages that are audience focused, they're evidence-based, and you're getting feedback into the process, you know, where you can adjust your messages um, with regards to how people are um, actually responding to them. So like I said, the guidebook's gonna go into so much more detail on each of these steps, um, but here's a quick overview. So the first step is to conduct audience segmentation. We know audience judges, crisis audiences, sorry, judges crisis messages based on the content of the message, the messenger of the message or the spokesperson and the communication channel that we're using. So it's actually really essential that we understand the communication preferences, including what channels different audiences um, prefer in order to increase you know, our reach and our impact, especially on social media. So in public health, we're often using demographics to understand our audiences. So that's things like age, uh, gender, income level, education, et cetera. But audience segmentation involves dividing audiences into subgroups based on other types of similarities, things like behaviors, are they engaging in it or not, um, their information needs, opinions on issues, values, which is a really important one, uh, especially if we think about vaccine hesitancy, and even the social determinants of health. So doing this supports the development of crisis messages that are you know, gonna be more suited to different Different communities' needs uh, and more reflective of their values. And this is much more likely to result in behavior change. And importantly, messages that actually are meeting the needs of different um, priority communities have more potential for engagement on social media and that kind of organic or viral spread of messages within, within social networks. So one important aspect of crisis communication is you know, working together with subpopulations or um, different communities to better understand their needs and then co-create the crisis messages together. So the one-way sort of push model of, of communication where we're providing a one-size-fits-all message 
for example, that you know the COVID-19 vaccine is safe and effective, isn't gonna meet all the needs of various communities. And with that example I provided, that certainly isn't meeting the needs of those that are vaccine hesitant. And that's really negatively impacting trust overall uh, for public health and government. <clears throat> so involving groups where possible in communication should be worked towards so that we can have more nuanced and targeted uh, relevant information. So next for step two, um, you're gonna draft crisis messages with something called guiding principles and then also theory. So I mentioned this, I think two or three slides ago, guiding principles of effective crisis communication have been identified that contribute to public trust. And we need to consistently apply these to uh, our crisis messages. So transparency is an extremely important, if not maybe the most important uh, guiding principle for effective crisis communication. And this involves telling people what we know, but really importantly, what we don't know about the emerging infectious disease. Um, and, you know, with regards to what we don't know, it involves also sharing, you know, how we're gonna go about finding that information out. So this is giving detailed information about how we're making decisions and priming audiences um, and the public to understand, you know, that the science is gonna change and recommendations are likely to change um, without negatively impacting the trust. Compassion and empathy is another important one, which shows um, the public, you know, that we care, that we understand they're facing hardships and that we're working towards helping them overcome these challenges. Clarity is another extremely important guiding principle where we're targeting and tailoring this information to different communities. It also involves the use of clear, or you might know it as plain language. Timeliness means you're providing information as soon as, you know, let's say the science comes out or as soon as decisions are made. And finally, correcting misinformation is directly, you know, understanding what mis and disinformation um, is circulating and then addressing those rumors, myths, and conspiracy theories. So those are the guiding principles that we know from the, the research are contributing to trust um, and that they should be consistently applied. So they're you know, very much interrelated and likely function together to increase message acceptance um, and overall to promote trust. And we found that increasing combinations of these, so you know, two, three, four, or all of them together, although that's rarely seen in the evaluations I've done, um, increases the odds of positive message response. And then theory can also help develop crisis messages that influence behavior. So you may have heard of the health belief model, um, and that's one such uh, theory that you can use to provide information about the threat which is the combination of severity and susceptibility information about the disease, and then also cues to action and efficacy information. There are a few other constructs in it as well, like barriers and benefits um, that I'm not gonna get into today. But severity is information about the health and social consequences of the disease um, and susceptibility information uh, shows people that they're vulnerable. So like number of cases rising in a community or variants that are being spread. Cues to action and efficacy, you know, prompt people to engage in the behavior and help them feel like, you know, I know what to do and how to act and the steps I need to take to do so. So really importantly, when crisis messages demonstrate both high threat and high efficacy, people are much more likely to engage in the recommended behavior. But if, you know, threat is low or efficacy is low or both are low, people actually respond defensively, ignore the message or reject it altogether. And thus, you know, don't engage in that behavior at all. And then the final step is choosing um, the appropriate communication channel, which you identify in the segmentation aspect in step one, and then making sure you monitor and evaluate your efforts. So one tool you can use is called sentiment analysis. And that actually tells you um, really easily the emotional response uh, people are having within the comments of your social media posts. And as you monitor sentiment, you're gonna develop a better understanding of you know, how people are responding to the different types of posts you're making, maybe with different constructs from the theory 
uh, different combinations of guiding principles, et cetera. And you can then use that information to feed back into it and increase that overall positive response. And why that's important is because negative comments on social media posts actually persuade others to view the post and sometimes even the source in a negative light. Uh, so it's important that you know we're overall promoting more positive emotional response. And then the other one you're likely very familiar with is engagement metrics. So that's things like likes, shares and retweets, or number of comments. Those show how actively involved your audience is with your content, <clears throat> excuse me. And kind of like with um, the comments, people are actually using the engagement information to evaluate your content and your source as well. So they're using this information um, to sort of impact their own attitudes about you know, the source of the information and the information itself. So again, you wanna have you know, high um, positive engagement overall. So understanding and incorporating these aspects that we know um, can increase positive messages, increase you know, positive engagement is going to overall increase the reach of your messages, but also have a positive impact. So I wanna acknowledge the participants within the SHRC grant who contributed to the guidebook and the evidence we used to develop it. Our partners included the Canadian Public Health Association and the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools, including Emily. Um, and I, I greatly appreciate all their input, especially into the research and development aspects um, of this guidebook and importantly, helping us disseminate it as widely as possible. And then finally, I just wanna acknowledge the fact that you know, public health works obviously within a governmental context and social media use in that context can be difficult. Sometimes it's due to resource restrictions and expertise, but oftentimes it can be due to lengthy approval processes. So overall, this guidebook is meant to help you understand the evidence, but then apply it, you know, as it fits within your own context and, you know, constraints, uh, if that applies to increase kind of the overall effectiveness of your communication on social media. So I so appreciate presenting today um, and I'd be really interested in chatting further, you know, obviously today, but if you have any feedback or ideas, I would welcome them. So I, you know, you can reach out my emails on the screen and I'm gonna share the link that you see on the screen as well in the chat now. So you can download the PDF of the guidebook. Uh, as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, first of all, you were an absolute champ for doing this um, on day two of COVID. You held up really well, I think. So thank you so much for still joining us. Um, this was a this was a really lovely um, overview of this this research project. I know it's hard to combine something that was so many months and years of work into something so <laughs> short, but this was absolutely fantastic. Uh, so this was this was great. Uh, we will hold questions and discussion to the end. I do see there was a bit of a chat, uh, a, a couple of thoughts in the chat, so we can bring that up when we get to the end. Okay. Um, but at this point, I will invite um, Alexa Ferdinand to share uh, to share your screen. And you can come off mute. Um, Alexa will be presenting um, on uh, collaborating with youth to address weight stigma in healthcare, education, and the home. Um, and uh, with that, I will hand it over to you, Alexa. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you very much um, for inviting me to present on my PhD research today. I'm really honored to be presenting alongside Melissa and Shannon. Um, so I'm a dietitian and postdoc in the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta. I completed my PhD last year under the supervision of Dr. Kim Rain, and the title of my project is Collaborating with Youth to Address Weight Stigma in Healthcare, Education, and the Home. I'd like to acknowledge that this research was conducted on Treaty 6 territory, and I'm committed to respecting the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. There we go. Um, so my research examined how young people experience weight stigma in all domains of their lives, like at school, at home, and the doctor's office. This is a story from one of my participants. Um, and so her name is Angela, and she's talking about her experiences of being bullied because of her weight at school. She said, 
A lot of the time during bullying, if I ever tried to stand up for myself, they would always say, well, it's true. They would call me fat and I would say like, hey, that's mean. And they'd say, but it's true, it's true. You know, they would say that for how fat I was, how ugly I was, how stupid I was. So I kind of developed this like super perfectionistic complex where I wanted to make sure that none of it would ever be true again. So that it couldn't be anyone's opinion that I was fat, that I could prove that I was skinny. I could prove that I was smart. So I became really obsessed with losing weight because like if I was clinically underweight, nobody could call me fat and they would never be right. I would have medical proof. So many of the participants that I interviewed, including Angela, developed eating disorders later in their life due to these kinds of experiences of fat shaming, thinking that the only way they could escape it was by becoming thin. So over the next 15 minutes, I'll review what weight stigma is and why it's important. Then I'll introduce institutional ethnography as the method that I used in my PhD. And I'll summarize some results from this work and highlight lessons learned, particularly as they relate to knowledge translation. So I worked at a weight, uh, weight management clinic in Edmonton as a dietitian for several years, which was what triggered my initial interest in weight stigma. And as a dietitian, I had been trained in conventional biomedical ways of knowing weight and health. So for example, I was taught that if I used an energy equation to calculate someone's resting metabolic rate and then subtracted 500 calories from that, patients would lose one to two pounds a week. But as I started working with real people, I quickly learned that bodies are not machines. Body weight is so much more complex than just energy in versus energy out. And when I was working at that weight management clinic, I was introduced to the concept of weight stigma and began to learn a bit more about its harmful effects, primarily through listening to patients talk about their experiences of it. They vividly recalled being bullied on the school ground or being teased at home by their parents, even though these events had occurred decades ago. I felt really uncomfortable with the idea that I may have been unintentionally contributing to weight stigma in my own practice. So I went back to grad school to learn more about it with the goal of finding strategies to reduce it. I know when I'm talking about weight stigma, I'm referring to the labeling, stereotyping, prejudice, and systemic discrimination of people based on their body size or weight. And weight stigma can be overt, like verbal bullying, or more subtle, like social exclusion. It tends to be perpetuated by moralistic assumptions about people based on their body size. So you're considered to be a good person if you're thin and a bad person if you're fat. Weight stigma goes far beyond just individual attitudes and beliefs about fatness, though. It's entrenched in the policies and the practices shaping our social institutions, like healthcare and education. So it's not that individuals have this malicious malintent towards people in larger bodies. It's that we're also being coordinated to behave in very specific ways by social structures often without our knowing. And from a public health perspective, weight stigma is really concerning because of the vast range of physical, mental, and social health consequences it has at both individual and population levels. So experiencing weight stigma can lead to things like anxiety, depression, eating disorders, social isolation, high blood pressure. Research has shown that toddlers by just the age of three prefer thin bodies over fat bodies. So this really highlights the need for a life course perspective when we're examining weight stigma and thinking about ways that we can reduce it. Negative beliefs and attitudes about fatness are shaped, by, or shaped throughout our lifespan by a range of social factors. Now, while there has been a fair bit of research in this area over the last few decades, comparatively little of it has directly engaged youth in it. Often researchers turn to adults to speak on their behalf. So I really wanted to fill this gap and work with youth more directly. So for my PhD, I used institutional ethnography. So Dorothy Smith developed institutional ethnography or IE as an alternative to conventional male dominated sociology, which tended to objectify people and their experiences. I was drawn to IE because of its practical intent being designed to help people better understand the world in which they live in order to change it for the better. Institutional ethnographers try to map out how something is happening rather than abstracting or theorizing why. 
And so this picture is from a workshop I had the opportunity to attend in Toronto. Um, Dorothy Smith is in the middle there in the purple. Institutional ethnographers pay attention to the work that people do in their everyday lives. And by work, Dorothy means um, she interprets work in a generous sense to include any activity, whether it be paid or unpaid, that requires time, energy, and intent. And in this research, I was really concerned with the work of growing up um, in a larger or a fat body. I recruited a total of 16 young people between the ages of 15 and 21 and interviewed them both one-on-one -on -one and in groups to learn about the trajectory of their experiences across the lifespan. Um, so these are two articles which came out of this institutional ethnography. Um, in the social science and medicine paper, we talk about how weight surveillance work was extremely common when participants were growing up. So this kind of work includes things like um, weighing themselves on scales and comparing their bodies to those of others around them. And the results of their surveillance instructed them on their next steps, whether that be working to fit in, both literally and figuratively, um, or resisting social conformity altogether. Participants' bodies were monitored by nearly everyone around them, and despite their mostly good intentions, surveillance by respected adults, like teachers or parents, conveyed to participants that their self-worth depended on their weight. And in the BMC public health paper at the bottom, um, we focused on young women's experiences specifically of interacting with fashion and media. And these participants learned from an early age that thinness was required for being seen and heard. Participants responded by performing three different kinds of work. So hiding their weight, trying to lose weight and resisting dominant weight discourses. Their resistance work was aided by, by the use of social media which offered them a sense of community and opportunities to learn about alternative ways of knowing body weight. However, social media content that talked about body acceptance or body positivity still tended to focus on weight loss. And while participants recognized the potential harm of engaging with commercial weight loss industries like diet and exercise, they still felt compelled to do whatever it might take to achieve the thin ideal. Despite some positive discursive change regarding body weight acceptance in fashion and media, this progress has had little impact on the social weight expectations for young women. So our findings highlight the need to broaden public health thinking around how weight discourses are reproduced. And we call for intersectoral collaboration that can mobilize weight stigma beyond predominantly, predominantly academic circles into our everyday practices. A key knowledge translation component of this of my PhD was working with a subset of these youth um, as co-researchers -re co in a youth weight stigma working group, where we developed recommendations for parents, educators, and healthcare providers. And through this group, um, I hope that participants would have an opportunity to speak back about or resist societal weight norms. Our working group meetings were framed around the critical analysis framework um, pictured here from Nixon and colleagues. So we apply this framework um, for each of our target audiences. So in the context of um, conversations with parents, healthcare providers and educators. So for example, when we were thinking about recommendations we'd like to make for healthcare providers, we went through these seven steps, um, starting with first name the problem. So in this case, weight stigma in healthcare. Second, identify the intentions behind the problem. Third, uncover the assumptions behind the problem. So if, um, for example, the assumption that weight and health are directly correlated or that weight loss is automatically beneficial for health. Uh, step number four, identify who benefits. So which groups of people are empowered or made to feel good about themselves because of these assumptions. Uh, step number five, identify who's disadvantaged or made to feel worse about themselves. So in this case, people in larger bodies. Step number six, link these ideas to societal level patterns. So thinking about what kinds of patterns of privilege and oppression are reinforced through these processes. And finally, um, conceive of alternatives or recommendations that might mitigate actual or potential harms. 
So we hired a graphic designer who was locally involved in weight stigma activism to develop a set of infographics illustrating these recommendations for both um, educators and healthcare workers. Key stakeholders in this design process were Obesity Canada, who we'd partnered with to get project funding, and Alberta Health Services Healthy Relationship with Food for Mind and Body Working Group. Two of the youth uh, participants also wrote blog posts for Obesity Canada, which advertised our key messages and also described their experiences of participating in the research. Um, so the youth came up with five points that they wanted to tell clinicians, which are outlined in this sample infographic here. So it's titled um, Healthcare Workers, Check Your Weight Bias Blind Spots. The first blind spot is put yourself in our shoes. Think about how we might feel when we enter a healthcare clinic. Many of us have had negative experiences with healthcare providers before. The second is reflect on your assumptions about people in larger bodies. This includes paying attention to your facial expressions and tone of voice when discussing weight. The third is give us space and listen to us. Do not assume that every health concern we have is weight related. Blind spot number four, what you say matters. If we're gonna talk about weight, ask for my permission and ask me what words I want to use when we're talking about bodies. And finally, um, is my weight relevant? Reflect on whether they actually need to be weighed at all during the visit. To reach parents, we chose to write an open letter um, given that strong emotional appeals can be attained through words. So grounded in our group's key messages, um, we drafted the letter in a Google Doc and circulated it around um, for edits and feedback. In terms of participatory approaches to knowledge mobilization, um, I co-presented these findings with two participants at local public health conferences. Um, and one participant also invited me to present at an undergraduate human ecology conference that she was organizing. Oops. So I think it's really important to showcase the process of doing this research, the relational how of it, rather than just the research outputs. Um, so in this paper, which was um, published in the International Journal of Qualitative Methods, we reflect on the process of using institutional ethnography in participatory research um, with young women. Although institutional ethnography was designed initially to help people better understand their social worlds, few IE articles actually explicitly document how findings are shared outside of academia. But this kind of documentation is really important if we want to learn from each other about what works and what doesn't in different contexts. Institutional ethnographers are often learning from and working with knowledge users and stakeholders who design and implement institutional policies and practices. So these parties can significantly influence whether and how IE findings and recommendations are used. Institutional ethnographies focus on institutions rather than individuals as the source of problems can also facilitate more productive discussions with knowledge users and stakeholders who might be more inclined to participate in research when they're not necessarily worried about being personally blamed about anything. So in that um, IJQM paper, we summarized how IE was a valuable tool for addressing four principles of participatory research. The first one is go beyond do, do no harm. The second is provide opportunities for giving feedback, create space for critical engagement, and finally, bring knowledge translation to the fore. Overall, um, we summarize in the paper how our experiences suggest value in IE as a pragmatic, flexible approach to public health research, which has unique methodological tools that can help to keep research participants in view. Um, so during and after this project, I got a lot of um, unsolicited feedback from participants in which they really felt grateful for having had the opportunity to feel seen and heard um, and connect with others about their shared experiences. They described feeling more confident and empowered to take action on weight stigma in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and these kinds of experiences with knowledge translation in my PhD have encouraged me to continue to pursue postdoctoral um, training in knowledge translation and public health. Um, so my current supervisor right now is Dr. Maria Mann. 
Um, but yeah, thank you very much for your time and I'll be hands, happy to answer questions in the collaborative Q&A. Wonderful, thank you so much, Alexa. This is um, so excellent and I think so timely as we hear more and more stories of um, bias in the medical field and, and this is really, really fantastic. Um, as we uh, need to keep to our schedule um, at this point, um, Shannon, yeah, you're up. Uh, so very much looking forward to Shannon's presentation. Um, she'll be presenting on art as a tool for promoting public and environmental health, a lesson plan for eco-justice educators. Um, so Shannon, without um, any further delay, it's all yours. Alrighty. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm very excited and honored to be chosen to speak here today. So um, as Emily mentioned, my name is Shannon Bird, and I'm an MPH student at Brock University. So through independent coursework over the last couple of months, I've been exploring the intersection of art, climate, and health. And I've created a knowledge translation tool in the form of a climate art lesson for youth. And so I'm really excited to share the process behind developing this tool, telling you what exactly it is, um, what my next steps are, and some ways that it might relate to your own work. All right, so first I would like to recognize that the land on which I developed this project is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people and the unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. This land is governed by the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850. I live and learn here as a white settler and I've developed my project from that perspective. I've infused my work with the diverse perspectives of many scholars, activists and artists from across Canada and I'm very grateful for their shared knowledge. So as an overview, I began this project actually in January of this year, and I was really interested in how public health is built into every aspect of life. So this is not just our biology and our health systems, but our income, our houses, our land, and our behaviors. So I decided to explore the role of health in the intersection of climate and art in youth populations. So I began with a literature review, and then I turned the knowledge that I gained into an art lesson plan for youth. This lesson plan has been iteratively revised by local activists, artists, and youth educators, and they've really helped me shape my lesson plan to the local needs of students across Ontario. Um, I also know that the inequitable arts and healthcare funding that happens in rural and northern Ontario result in barriers and adverse outcomes for youth in those regions, so I prioritize those communities whenever possible. My project still is in its infancy, and so as my next steps this summer, I'm really excited to start implementing and evaluating this project. Um, so various organizations are going to be teaching this uh, lesson plan with the goal of improving public and environmental health in their communities. So when I began conceptualizing this project, like all public health professionals, I was faced with a really overwhelming number of problems to solve and a massive amount of research at my disposal. And because I knew I was interested in environmental health, this can sometimes be really frustrating just because the research shows an overwhelming number of negative health outcomes from climate change without really a lot of action to prevent or mitigate against this on a large scale. But I do have a lot of experience working with youth populations in artistic spaces, and I've learned that creativity and young passion are sometimes a really incredible cure for apathy. So this is why I chose to combine my three personal passions of youth empowerment, climate science, and art. So when I started looking at these three topics through a scholarly lens, I learned a few key things. The World Health Organization has identified climate change as the single biggest health threat facing humanity, so addressing the climate crisis is a pretty good way to do impactful work in public health. Almost half of the people on the planet are under age 25, but the average age of world leaders is 62. To me, this means that youth are a population with agency that is not being translated into action. But the literature suggests that the strongest climate action doesn't come from sharing more really scary data with divided societies. Rather, it comes from offering an alternative, sustainable future that's more inviting than the climate crisis that we're headed towards. We need to communicate the beauty of a healthy, just, and green society. So how do we do this? It turns out that art is an ideal communication tool because it's much more inclusive as a social practice than science is. At the intersection of these three topics, we find climate art. Climate art can be described as all art that's created to respond to environmental concerns in creative ways. This is often done as a form of activism. 
So the first step in my project was to do a literature review, examining climate advocacy, youth engagement, and art. I examined how health fit at the intersection of these elements and how they all contributed to promoting and maintaining health. I learned that art is not only a valuable form of creativity, but also of exploration and investigation. Especially in youth, art is really important for exploring and shaping the world around us. I learned about eco-justice education, which is a type of education that teaches about the environment from a diverse and equity-focused lens. Highlighting that the climate crisis is not a problem for which we need scientific solutions anymore, now it's a cultural crisis for which we need to implement solutions through policy. The Ontario education system lacks eco-justice and environmental training for both students and teachers. I read about the calls coming from public health experts for more interdisciplinary thinkers to remove us from the silos that we're currently working in so we can better solve complex public health problems. The separation of arts and science training from a really early age prevents creative and interdisciplinary problem solving. Reading all of this, I was really inspired. I began to think about how climate, science, climate art is an interdisciplinary field that combines health, science, and art, and can be used to teach public health thinking, and also is a representative of eco-justice principles. <laughs> Youth climate art is a tool for record keeping, education, awareness, activism, and personal, public, or environmental health. Notably, I read Summer and Klokner's work that found most the most engaging type of climate art is that which featured something called awesome solutions. This is art that envisions a climate conscious future and it consistently receives more emotional responses than other types of climate art. For example, those that give us warnings of the dystopia that we might be headed towards. At the end of my literature review, the public scholar health scholarship was very clear. Art is beneficial for youth. The climate crisis is best addressed from a cultural perspective youth are important agents of social change, and public health is improved when youth engage with art. What wasn't clear is who was going to do anything about this. Despite the really clear benefits of climate art for youth, few related programs exist, and even fewer explore the really critical connections to public health. So to share these findings and to create a program to fill that gap, I decided to put together a KT tool in the form of a climate art lesson for youth. My lesson plan focuses on climate art, teaching how this can be used as a tool to improve human and environmental health. The lesson plan I've created guides instructors through how to take advantage of the space and the supplies that they already have, and it gives them an overview of the public health literature. The lesson is divided into three parts. Part A is an introduction on how climate, health, and art are interconnected. Part B gives examples of climate artists. And part C is when students are invited to create their own art. So in part A, students are exploring that connection between climate, art, and health. This is a conversation between the instructor and the students, guided by some questions and sample answers that I've given in the lesson plan. For example, the instructors can ask about what the elements of human health are, what the elements of environmental health are, and how those things are connected. Students can give answers like, dirty water transmits bacteria that cause disease, or healthy soil grows healthy food, or biodiversity results in lots of different plants, which we need for lots of different medicines. The instructor can then ask how art is used for climate advocacy, and students can talk about things like protest posters, or recycled art, or songwriting and street art. In the climate art examination, the lesson plan shares information about diverse Canadian artists, and it provides examples of some of their work. After looking at their work, the students will discuss how that art benefits the land and the people in their communities. For example, the students will be given an example of an artist who does artistic habitat restoration work, and they might talk about how that art provides places for birds to come and breed, or gardens to grow, or families to come and picnic. In the art making part of the project, students will be asked to consider two quotes from fostering colleagues, and then they'll be invited to create any art that comes to their imagination. I'm going to share these quotes with you, and they are, for humans to have an ethical relationship with the land, we must imagine our space and place on it and a sustainable future. And imagination is not just about the future, but also thinking about how and where we're living now, for whom we're responsible and why. 
My hope is that these quotes, in combination with parts A and B of the lesson, will inspire students to create climate art focused on those awesome solutions I talked about, featuring their idea for a sustainable future. To promote inclusion and accessibility, the lesson is designed to be done with any material in any space, with young learners of any age and ability. Examples of artistic outcomes include poems or skits or recycled art collages or paintings. Following the lesson, these art pieces can be shared at climate action events or with local policymakers to amplify youth opinions on the reciprocal relationship between public and environmental health. This lesson reflects public health interests in a multitude of ways. Through two main methods, the project acts as a short-term public health intervention. The act of art making itself is known to improve health, and the lesson is also pre is presented in a way intended to be empowering and provide a sense of purpose or community to these students, which also improves health. In two further methods, the project represents an investment in improving public health for the long term. It teaches public health thinking to our next generation of citizens and leaders, and the lesson also creates an interest in improving environmental health through climate advocacy. It's increasingly obvious that we as public health professionals have a role to play in addressing the climate crisis, as do all people. However, many people are uninterested or misinformed about these things because of a lack of scientific literacy. Many students who are not keeping up with the science and English curriculum in schools are unlikely to gain these skills in our current school system. However, my KT tool blends these critical skills with art communication to be more inclusive and ensure that these important messages reach all students. Importantly, it teaches kids that they can affect their own health and the health of the surrounding environment in positive ways. So to achieve these outcomes, my KT tool must be disseminated to young learners across the province. Presently, the art lesson has been accepted for summer programming at Gold Lake Outdoor Center. So the lesson will be used by facilitators to run programming independently. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the results of the art making and hearing some feedback on the lesson through an evaluation form I sent over. Further, I'm going to be guiding program implementation at the North Bay Perry Sound District Health Unit. And I'm really excited to be running several events over the summer which will include some land-based youth events and some train-the-trainer events for leaders at local youth organizations. As public health professionals, my hope is that this work is going to be relevant to all of you. I believe that the insights I've gained from this work apply to you no matter what area of health you consider your expertise. First, youth populations should be increasingly considered when conceptualizing research and KT efforts. Youth are equal actors with the capacity to understand timely issues like the climate crisis, and should be granted the right to enact social change within their own lives. They simply need the support of proper KT efforts. Secondly, when engaging with the community, public health professionals can really benefit from using art methodologies. The literature discusses how exclusive science can be and how much we could increase the reach of our health messaging when we use art. Answering the call to make public health more intersectoral requires going way upstream and making all public education and community engagement more holistic. My KT project works towards raising a generation of interdisciplinary thinkers who will work outside of silos in 2042 when they participate in the workforce. They will have the skills to envision health and science in really innovative ways and use art to communicate these ideas. Thirdly, art can be used as a direct public health intervention. Creativity can communicate, but also support health and should not be separated from public health efforts for an unscientific reputation. Creative public health programming is beneficial for land, people, and health systems. Finally, as I leave you today, I will offer you two things that I have learned to be true about art. There is no such thing as being good at art. However, we are all capable of doing a lot of good with art. It's become really evident to me that the improvement of public health in a time of political polarization relies increasingly on community efforts to make meaningful changes. Art is a really powerful way to center conversations with excluded voices or advocate for change, keep a record of our history, create connections with community members, and actively improve our health all throughout this process. Skills learned from engaging with art, like creativity and interdisciplinary thinking, are crucial to solving the complex public health problems that we're facing today. Public health metrics are found in all elements of climate art. Climate art and advocacy shape environmental health, 
which shapes human health, which is shaped in turn by the art making and advocacy work. Creativity, climate, and health are deeply interconnected. And by making the effort to improve one, we can improve all of them for a whole community. Thank you very much to those named on the screen for your help with all of my work. Without you, my project certainly wouldn't exist. And thank you to everyone in the audience for your time. Wonderful, Shannon. Um, that was uh, an absolutely wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you so, so much for sharing that with us. Um, I had never, I wasn't familiar with climate art or um, being able to, to communicate this way. So this was, this was really um, absolutely a pleasure for me. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing this with us. Um, so at this point uh, in the webinar, um, we will open it up now for some uh, Q&A. Um, and uh, general discussion, whatever uh, whatever we're feeling is, is most appropriate now. Um, and I have noticed there's been some really actually great uh, discussion in the chat. Um, rather than than reading through, I'm wondering if um, first, I think the first, uh, first couple of questions and comments were for Melissa. Um, Melissa, would you mind commenting on uh, a little bit about what's been happening in the in the chat box? Yeah, sure. So um, Caitlin Greer um, shared an interesting poll. Um, from a group called Abacus Data, and I quickly looked up. I don't know anything about them. It looks like they're a strategy firm, um, but they did a survey of 1,500 Canadians. I think it was a representative sample. I didn't really have time to get into the methods too much, but what is interesting and likely reflective of um, other polls that I've seen is how many Canadians believe in um, conspiracy theories, such as like the government's coming, covering up how many people have died from the vaccine, seen um, they said that's like 5.6 million Canadian adults believe that um, and other such trust issues which really sort of speaks to what I was talking about uh, you know that people are really questioning the trustworthiness of government um, and of public health and other institutions and even science um, and it was declining before the pandemic and I think the pandemic has just made that altogether uh, worse and accelerate um, faster so I think transparency is one of the big things um, that's shown in the research to be able to overcome not only mis and disinformation, but demonstrate your trustworthiness. And, you know, if you reflect on the crisis communication, probably in the beginning, it was maybe a little bit better, but since, especially I live in Ontario and, you know, there was very little transparency for, for example, things like, you know, what are the various stages related to, there was never communication about cutoffs, about, you know, what, like what it all meant um, and how decisions were being made, just as an example. Um, so I think it's it's really concerning, but it speaks again to the fact that, um, you, you know, we have this kind of like one size fits all or um, a general kind of one way push of information from public health and government. Um, like for example, with the vaccines, um, I did interviews and, every participant said, you know, that that message that they're safe and effective is not meeting my needs because I don't believe they're safe and effective. They're, um, and and they that's kind of pushing them towards feeling like they need to collate information from a lot of sources and opening them up into um, more kind of alternative uh, sources of information that have a lot more mis- and disinformation. And that tends to be a lot more certain, um, a lot more kind of nuanced and, and targeted information that is better meeting their needs um, and kind of seems to be further entrenching those that are skeptical or feeling like public health isn't trustworthy um, into kind of that far right um, or alternative set of information. So the other, Caitlin said, you know, I wonder if there's an opportunity to combine these two pieces. I'm not really sure, but I think it's, I think they've done a really nice job of presenting their data, just talking about like knowledge translation or knowledge mobilization. Um, and I like sort of how simple and how they've kind of done that reverse pyramid where the most important information is first. Um, and I think they've you know, made a really nice sort of overview, which I think is something um, I need to do with the guidebook is kind of develop some more like one pager or like um, overviews of some of the aspects. Okay, I feel like I've talked <laughs> probably long enough. <laughs> no, no, this was great. It wasn't a, I mean, it wasn't a direct, Q&A type of thing, but um, I think that was a really fantastic summary of the discussion. And thank you for your comments. That was that was fantastic. Um, and then Alexa, there was some really great uh, discussion related to yours as well. Uh, do you mind commenting on the on the chat? 
Yeah, so there was, it was Caitlin Greer and Jillian, I think as well, we're both talking about um, mobilizing this kind of research in eating disorder healthcare. Um, and then they kind of talked a bit about how um, you can have an eating disorder at all sizes, all bodies on the spectrum can kind of fall into that category. And that definitely came up in my research. Um, yeah, so like I spoke a bit, a little bit about many of them experienced or faced disordered eating and they, that didn't necessarily mean that they were rail thin, but they, they themselves talked about kind of the stigma they faced when going to, um, and there was one person who did go to an outpatient eating disorder treatment center and feeling like she was the largest one in the room and that kind of thing. Um, and not really feeling like physicians are necessarily believing her when she's like talking about her actual eating disorder. Um, so I would just, yeah, preface all this stuff with, I'm definitely not an eating disorder expert. So I don't um, say that, I, I wouldn't say that I have the most current knowledge on exactly what's going on in that world right now. Um, but with the um, Alberta Health Services group that I had worked with, they were um, connecting with primary care networks and um, yeah, physicians around the province involved in weight related issues, including eating disorders to kind of um, disseminate some of this information that had come out of the research. One of the problems I faced was that it was the first summer of the pandemic was when most of this stuff was being produced and I was trying to figure out strategies for um, connecting with yeah clinicians and such and at that point that was definitely not in their range radar they didn't have the capacity to kind of even think about what to do with this information um and another barrier or something that's a struggle is the fact that there is a ton of evidence and research on the, these exact issues that were presented in the chat it's now how do we mobilize that and how do we get that into the hands and minds of clinicians um, and change healthcare systems. Like we know that that stuff takes years, it takes time. Um, and how do we go about it? I, I don't, yeah, that's kind of an ongoing debate and struggle. Definitely not gonna be a, a quick or easy solution, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, into the Q&A, we received a, a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, for Alexa, uh, I was wondering if you've noticed any differences based on gender in the experiences of youth in bigger bodies. For example, if any transgender or non-binary youth have participated in your research, I'd be interested to hear about their experiences. Yeah, so I didn't, it was quite a small sample, so I didn't have any transgender or non-binary youth in my sample. I did, um, so that was one of the papers fo focused predominantly on young women because 14 of the 16 were women that participated. Um, so I did talk to two um, people that identified as male and their experiences were, were quite different. Um, there was, yeah, there was a lot of stuff with regards to gender that came up. Um, a lot of the really traditional kind of um, you need to be thin to get a husband to marry like you won't find a husband if you're not thin that kind of messaging that was happening from really your early age for um, the girls that kind of those kinds of conversations weren't happening in the two boys that I spoke with but that is also kind of reflected in the broader literature as well um, there is also more and more research though speaking to the, like the the masculine like the mesomorphic body ideal like um, so it's definitely not that men, boys and men aren't facing body and weight related issues. They're just very different. Um, and yeah, and amongst women, it's, it's yeah, just really, really pervasive. Um, and I think also at that age frame, age range that we were at, like the, I initially had wanted to interview girls that were younger, um, but it really, they told me that it wasn't until that they were like older that they felt comfortable even speaking about the topic. Like it was still too, um, they couldn't even like wrap their hands, heads around questioning those thin ideals at a younger age. It wasn't until they were older and had kind of sat with those thoughts and stuff for a bit. But anyway, so yeah, I don't know if I really answered that question, but no, I didn't interview anyone that was non-binary or transgender. Thank you. Um, thank you for the, the thoughtful response. Um, I think that that's really helpful. Um, great. So we do have time for more uh, questions and more, more discussion. Um, Melissa, Melissa had shared in the chat a really interesting podcast about uh, diet culture, fatness, and how much harm is caused by weight stigma. Um, and then she did post the link with a caveat that she doesn't always agree with their methods or a discussion of method issues with research, but, but is very interesting. Um, I had recently done some, some uh, stumbled upon a really um, 
I don't know, for me, eye opening article about um, some of the the roots of fat phobia and how it actually uh, came from from racism, anti black racism. And I had no idea about this until I mean, a few months ago, when I came across this article. And um, I mean, the overlaps and overlapping spheres of, of discrimination are really just, yeah, uh, uh, really something to, to, to contend with. Um, so something else to, to consider. Um, but that's great. Um, oh, we've got another question. Uh, Shannon, um, I love the idea of using art as a tool for education and climate advocacy. I was wondering if you've done and um, if you've done or are planning to do any collaboration with Indigenous communities for these lessons. Um, I was thinking that having an Indigenous elder involved in the lessons and art creation would be really interesting and beneficial. Yeah, so um, I actually have had the really incredible privilege of being invited into several different Indigenous communities um, that are within the Health Unit region up here, um, where I'm located right now. Um, as of right now, um, the question also speaks to having elders involved, which is something I would love to do. A big consideration I have is time. And you can't always just say, this is my timeline. I would love to have partners and expect that to work. Um, because this project started as a four month independent study, I couldn't make that happen with an Indigenous partner because I would have had to enforce my timelines and that wouldn't have been appropriate. Um, so, you know, I had to start independently and then the project moved into, um, I, I'm now able to go into Indigenous communities as part of my practicum with the health unit. Um, so again, it's a four month timeline. I'm not able to open up too much to collaboration because of those timelines, but I'm able to bring the work there and um, those who are interested in it can, you know, use the resources that I'm providing. Um, yes, I would love to move into the space of more, um, you know, knowledge exchange. Um, I think that would be really exciting. I love the idea of Put Forward. Um, but again, time is the really big factor that I'm dealing with right now. That's completely understandable. And I mean, really impressive work for things that have been done on such, such uh, short <laughs> timelines. So that's that's really wonderful. You said you were in, um, you're at North Bay Perry Sound? Yes, that's right. That's wonderful. We're working with them as well um, with a with a knowledge broker program. So uh, really great, great that you're there too. Um, I feel like this this we've been one of the one of the issues we've been grappling with um, at the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools is um, our definition of evidence and uh, when we conduct evidence syntheses things like reviews. Um, can we consider indigenous sources of evidence and indigenous worldviews and how do we do that and is that something that we should be doing even and um, I, I really love that this is a you know art is something that speaks to everybody, right? Um, and it's, it's going to be different for everybody, but it's it's something that really does, I mean, uh, I don't know, across all societies and worldviews, there's there's art. Um, that is something that is really across all humans. And um, I don't know, I thought it was a really great, uh, great perspective that was that was shared. We do have a few more, uh, a little bit more time for questions. Um, do any of our panelists have any questions for one another? If not, that's okay. Um, it's been really wonderful learning from from all of you. Um, these are all such different uh, projects, um, really, really different topic areas, really different methodologies, but absolutely amazing um, seeing um, the quality of work that's being done, um, the methods that go into this, um, and the really creative knowledge translation. Um, one of the reasons that we continue to host these awards is that um, we really do want to highlight the amazing work that is that is going on um, in terms of knowledge translation in public health um, and students are really um, usually at um, or often at uh, the forefront of that um, uh, leading the way in terms of really new and creative um, and innovative ideas. Um, great, so we have one more question has come in so we'll do that and then we will go to our uh, uh, end of webinar polling questions. Um, the question was for Shannon. Um, I was wondering if the lessons focus on a specific form of art, like painting or drawing, etc., or if they incorporate multiple forms. Yeah, so um, that second part is exactly right. The idea is that the lesson plan is open to every form of art. So when I'm going into community, I'm bringing supplies for things like 
sketching or creative writing, you know, these are really simple supplies. Um, I'm also bringing some recycled supplies for things like collage, um, but I'm also um, making sure that the project is open to the kids creating things like dance or skits or songs, um, which is what makes it so wonderful is that the kids can use any medium that speaks to them most to communicate their ideas for sustainability and a better future. Um, the art doesn't restrict them in any way, which I think is the most exciting part. It also makes it a lot more accessible because in some classrooms or some communities, um, there's less supplies available, obviously. And so you, there are lots of art forms can be done without requiring any supplies, which is really exciting. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much, Shannon. Sounds like a really wonderful program. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Just, oh, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say, Shannon, that I really appreciate this, your project, because prior to starting my PhD, I was in knowledge mobilization, like as a knowledge broker type role for, I don't know, like 10 years or something like that. And a lot of the like more recent chatter was around, you know, arts based KT or KMB or whatever you want to call it. And I, that's not my forte. Uh, so I never, I never really had a good grasp on like what that could look like. And I feel like this was a really nice concrete example of how you can use creativity and art um, to do some of that knowledge translation. So I really appreciate that. And I feel like it could um, be translated to other topics as well. Thank absolutely. you. Yeah, absolutely. I think it would translate really well to lots of other things. Climate is where I've started, but um there's lots of potential for this type of thing, which is why I'm excited to present it here today, right? Yeah, thanks. Great, all right, thank you, Melissa and Shannon. That's that's wonderful. Um, so we will move, um, as, we're, as we're wrapping up, uh, we do have um, just a couple more slides and comments and a few more polling questions. Um, so the NCCMT is always interested to hear um, about how you are using EIDM in your practice, that's evidence-informed decision-making, um, or maybe some of the challenges that you are encountering. Um, our email address is on the screen. Um, we recognize that as the pandemic is, I mean, at least um, on some stages, winding down, um, we recognize that um, there are there certainly are some challenges um, in terms of using evidence, and it's been a while for a lot of people um, after two years of maybe working in a vaccine clinic or contact tracing. It's it's uh, definitely a challenge. So um, please feel free to re to reach out to us. Um, we do appreciate your feedback. Um, so we have set up a number of polling questions. Please feel free to. Um, uh, uh, complete the polling questions uh, with your opinions of the webinar today. Um, we're asking about, you know, whether you feel that the webinar increased your knowledge and uh, understanding of evidence-informed decision-making, and I mean, in this case, as well as, as knowledge translation, um, which are often used uh, fair, fairly interchangeably, um, and whether or not some of the information from today's webinar would be useful for, for you uh, in your practice. Um, so please make sure that you uh, select for either of those. Um, and then at the bottom, um, a couple of questions about what you agree with um, about uh, how the webinar applied to your work, uh, whether it was facilitated well, if there were opportunities to participate, um, easy to follow, and whether we did meet your expectations uh, for this webinar. Um, so please make sure that you select for, for all of those and uh, hit submit uh, once you have finished that. So we will wrap up that poll. Um, and then for more information, um, please feel free to reach out to us um, at nccmt at mcmaster.ca. Um, our website is uh, nccmt.ca. Uh, that's a great place to sign up for our newsletter to always find out when we do hold webinars and things like the knowledge translation uh, student award uh, application period. Um, if you are interested in getting in touch with any of the panelists and you missed their email addresses during the, uh, during the presentations, um, don't hesitate to reach out with us. We can get you in touch um, if you do have any questions for them as well. Um, so before we close out, um, I will invite uh, each of the panelists, perhaps um, in the order that you presented, um, if you want to uh, say any closing remarks, um, and, and then we will we will wrap up. So I think that starts with Melissa. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for um, having me today. And uh, like I said before, I was really honored to receive the award. And, um, you know, yeah, just I was in really good company. So I really enjoyed learning about the other projects today. So I, thank you. Thanks.
Um, yeah, I also very honored to be here today and really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I think everyone aside from me is out east, so it's cool to learn about what's going on in Ontario. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for ha um, having me and yeah, feel free to email me if you have any questions about my work too. Yeah, I think I'm going to sum up pretty much the same way. This is so exciting to be here. Um, yeah, I would love to be in touch with anyone who has ideas about collaboration or is interested in my work. Um, yeah, it was so exciting to be presenting alongside my two co-presenters. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so huge thanks to our presenters. Um, thank you to the other uh, national collaborating centers for their contributions in uh, reviewing and selecting uh, the applications for this award. Um, and with that, um, we will we will wrap up. Um, so I want to wish everybody a wonderful summer, uh, wherever it is that you're located, um, and uh, wishing you all the best. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we'll see you all hopefully at another session. Take care. <laughs>